All right, so this is the third lecture. In the first two lectures, we were talking about an introduction about machine learning. And then we talked about perceptron model, which is a linear classifier, um, an intuitive one, pretty simple and intuitive. And we talked about how we're going to you know, use perceptron learning um, algorithm to converge, to, to classify, actually, a, a linearly separable space within certain iterations, right? So today we're going to talk about another major uh, tool in supervised learning, which is called regression. Perhaps uh, you've heard the word uh, a lot of times. So we're going we're to see what regression is. So let's just uh, have a recap on let's just have a recap on what we have discussed already. Right? So that was an example we talked about in, in a previous lecture. So we thought that if we want to have a classifier that, you know, when given an applicant info, so those information could be age, could be gender, salary, current debt, um, the years in residence in that specific address, and so on and so forth. So, and if we had historical data, that whether or not given that vector of you know information or vector of features, we call it feature vector of that applicant, uh, can we come up with the, the classifier that decides instead of a bank expert whether or not to approve the the credit card application of that you know a specific applicant? All right, and we talked about perceptual learning algorithm or PLA. We we mentioned that. Let me see how did. We activate this pointer P. So we, we talked about the perceptual learning algorithm and then how we got rid of the, the bias term or the threshold and start from zero instead of starting from one. So now we have a pretty neat sign function. So the sign will output either plus or minus one, right? And that was our hypothesis. We thought, uh, we, we, although, uh, we already spoke about having different hypotheses, and we choose the best one that works the best within the set of all H, or capital H, uh, all the set of our hypotheses. So the hypothesis that work in, in the, with perceptual learning algorith uh, algorithm is that sign function of the summation of Ws and Xis. And we talked about those Ws as the weights we assign for each of those features that we have in the feature vector, right? So as, as, a, as, a, as a bank expert, you can come up manually with certain features that you think uh, that are more important for an application, right? So the task of machine learning, and in, in this case, the PLA, is to understand what are the optimal weight, what are the, what are the optimal vector weight in vector space. So this is in vector space. So we're going to find the optimal weight here, right? So that every time we use that for a specific application as an input, and on scene, a new application, a new applicant comes with a new application. So the sign will tell us either plus or one, approve or reject, right? And then we talk about how we're going to evaluate it, right? Was it, you know, was it correctly? classified or it wasn't, right? We did the true label, we call it tree, or uh, we can call it y again. It depends on the no notion. Sometimes we, we call the prediction or the predicted output y hat. And we said that this y was unknown at first, so we try to mimic our y hat as our prediction to sort of match the, the real y. We will talk more on the not uh, notation at, at every you know step of the way. So let me just clear this. So what happened here?
You used to have a remove button or something. Oh, erase pen. E. Okay. So now talking about the vector space. So in vector space, that's that's the application. That's that's the feature vector of the application. You saw that in the previous slide. It was this way, right? It was horizontal. In vector space, it's vertical, right? And so if you want to have the sine function work on that, so we're going to transpose the vectors here because we are trying to have an inner product of these two, right? So, and, and we talk about how we're going to remove the threshold and embed it into the, the summation itself. So x1 and w1, that was the, the artificial coordinate removed from the the first formula and added in, and, and, and embedded here. So these two are referring to the first iteration. And the next up to the d, d-dimensional, depending on the, the features you have. So that was sort of a recap of the previous lecture. We talked about the, the perceptual learning algorithm that since we have a binary class, there are two cases that we're going to have a misprediction, right? Let's call them with the hat. Our prediction was plus one while the real value was minus one. Or the other way around, our prediction was minus one and the real class of the, the applicant was indeed an approval, right? So for these two cases, this output is not equal to, right, the y1. Or better, I'm going to call this t, which is the true value. So this is the y hat. I'll post a new version after the class. So our prediction is not equal to the, the actual value. And we, th we talked about the very uh, simple way to fix this. And we said that if there are two vectors in space that are having um, a degree lower than 90 degrees, right? So their sine value is always positive. However, in this case, if we have the output of a sine value of two vectors having lower than 90 degrees as their angle as positive, that shows a misclassification, right? So how are we going to solve it? So we have to add the w plus yx to the amount of vector to just, you know, fine tune the direction that the, the w is pointing at. On the other case, now we have two vectors having lower than 90 degrees angle. So the sine function should have output minus uh, plus one because they are having lower than that, right? But the output was minus one, so that was a misclassification again. In order to solve that for the next iteration, we need to add again the same wx to this vector. So this vector becomes in this direction. And then we talk about how many iterations it's going to need. So the high level overview of the PLA was you initialize all those w's. For t from 1 up to the unknown, which I'll talk about it, at most it's going to be all of your points, right? If there exists an, an i with this, which was the misclassification uh, mis uh, status, you're going to update your w's with y i x i. And then you're going to use that updated weight for that. The final iteration, when it's going to stop, your w the vector of w will be your optimal w, right? So here's a nice tool that you can use to visualize this. Let me see if I can run it here. So here. I've already posted the link on Moodle as well. So you can define some you know, classes of points in this case, green and, and red. So later on, you're going to add some more stuff to that. So uh, it's going to go towards neural network. But for now, you just have to care about this side, right? And then by adding or removing points and a starting point, I believe here we can animate. And it's going to go towards all the points that are having this classification. And you see at each one how many created you have. And when all the iterations are made, it's going to stop. So those iterations are not necessary now. You can stop the 
encounter, right? So PLA is a very simple yet powerful tool with, with just one caveat, and the point is the, da the, the, the data should be linearly separable, right? We're talking about how we're going to um, define a linear, linearly separable data set. So now the issue is when we have a nonlinear separable data set, how are we going to use a linear classifier here, right? OK. And that's going to be what we're going to discuss in this lecture. So at first, we're going to talk about a little bit about learning notion. Um, then we're going to talk about how we're going to input, how we're going to represent some type of inputs. In this specific case, there are images. And then we're going to talk about pocket algorithm, which is an extension of PLA for non-linear separable data sets. And then the, the bulk of the course will be spent on linear regression today. I don't think we're going to touch on nonlinear transformation. Perhaps it's going to be for next lecture. OK? So sometimes here, OK. All right. So let's talk about the feasibility of learning and some general ideas about it. Suppose you have a bin of marbles. And they have two different classes, right? Red and green. So we call mu as the probability of red marbles inside that bin, right? And mu is unknown. We don't know uh, the, the actual value of that probability. What we know is that, uh, is that we have a bin with two different classes. And we are taking samples out of that bin, right? Say we take 10 samples. So in this instant that we took 10 samples, it turned out that we have three red and seven green, right? So now let's compute the fraction of red marbles inside the sample we took out of the bin, right? We call this nu now. So nu as the, the Greek word. So now we have mu and nu. Now, so as I say, uh, the uh, picking a red marble has a probability of new, mu, and therefore, one minus new, one minus mu is is going to be the the, uh, uh, the probability of picking green marble out of that. Okay. This value is unknown, right? We pick n some n, n marbles independently, and the fraction we compute it as new. All right, so. How are we going to establish a relationship now? How are we going to de define a relation between mu and nu? Does these two say anything about each other, right? Does nu say anything about mu here? Does it? What do you think? So, so mu is the, it's right here actually. So mu is the probability of red beans inside a bean, and nu is the probabilities or the fraction of red marbles out of your sample that you got from this. So we have two different probabilities now, right? Can you just say that mu is like a estimator for mu, and as like a sample, as you increase the samples, that mu approaches mu? Pretty good. What else? Any contracting ideas? Uh, I don't think so they can be related because um, if, like, let's suppose all are green, uh, until we got to the last one, we cannot say like how much uh, red we have. Right. So you, we cannot be uh, in deterministic mode? Yeah. Okay. Until we re reach the last one. Right. So probabilistically, can we say anything about it? Yeah, the more sample, more the we. Okay. Is it normally like 1 minus mu equals mu? Uh, we wish, but no. no, no. Yeah. 
I mean, one minus one minus mu is the probabilities of green inside the bean, right? But what's going to be outside the bean? We call that mu, right? Yep. I guess the bigger the, our sample becomes, it gets closer to the actual mu. Yeah, that makes sense. Why? That's because they're going to be the same like, in terms of number. I, I don't know deeply, but in terms of number, it's going to be the same sample. It's a big okay. sample, which is the same thing. That, that, uh, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. I guess like, it depends on the guarantees of like randomness and like uniform randomness within the container. Yeah. So, uh, assume that this is uh, perfectly randomized. Okay. Uh, we call this Bernoulli uh, variable. So. IID variable. Okay. Good. Okay. So in general, does does new say anything about mu? In general, no, because samples can be mostly red, right? While bean was mostly green. So even if you had ten greens inside, there was a slight chance that you take ten and all those ten would become green, right? That would be the worst scenario, but it it, it could have happened. So However, as, as your colleague uh, pointed out, the sample frequency of these two are likely going to be close to each other, right? If we carry on doing it for a lot of times, or better, if we have bigger sample, so we can, we can uh, probably say that these two are going to be close to each other, right? So now, let's talk about the other way around. Does new say anything about mu? So if somebody just looks at this and doesn't know anything about the bean. Same question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I actually, it's not the same question. It's like, the other one is like, yes and no. But the second one is what exactly, right? What is likely... It, it, New say about mu. If you didn't know anything about the bin, you could like, assume that the sample is just a small version of the bin. So everything in the bin is just a sample multiplied by a certain quantity. Um, to some extent. OK. I was going to say something to the fact that there's, let's say, the 10 marbles. Like, in the bin, there should be roughly the same distribution based on the sample, but we can't guarantee. Yeah. Okay. So as 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 most of you have guessed, yeah, we cannot be certainly sure what's going to be the relationship between these two, or whether or not they they are having a, a direct relationship or not. But let's say we are in consensus that in a big sample, say instead of ten, we were picking two hundred, right? So in a having a large n, your fraction of red marbles, which we call it new, is probably, and um, I'm, I'm going to stress on the word probably, probably it's going to be close to the probability of red marbles within a certain margin, right? We call that margin epsilon. Okay. All right. So a researcher in, in, in the 60s came up with the an in, 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 uh, equality called Hefting's inequality. And it's been there for a long, long time, and it still, you know, makes sense. So that, that's the paper I brought up here if you wanted to have a look. So he's saying that in a very big sample, when we have a large n, your nu is probably close to mu within epsilon, right? So that's the inequality. Let's, look, uh, let's talk about it a little bit. So. In general, we are interested in having a probability smaller than some value, right? We are interested to have this smaller than that. So if this is a small, we are in a good position because we know that the, the out of sample we took out of that is going to be pretty close to what was inside our sample, right, in sample. And that is within epsilon, right? But we don't want this to be 
greater than epsilon, right? So the output of that, the output of that, that probability is not a good news. It's, it's a bad news, right, for us. Because this is bigger than certain epsilon. We want to we make sure it's smaller than that. So we have to make sure that this side is small. So at least, you know, we diminish the effect of that bad news over there. The good point was this side was having a, a negative exponential, right? So in general, you know that it's going to go very, it's going to start from very high point. So say this is y. And the more you go on the x, it's going to go down, right? However, the same epsilon that was there that we wanted to make sure is small is going to act as a square here and it's going to make the, the, the final exponent so, so small that actually it doesn't even matter, right? So we have to make sure that we pick the right epsilon and we pick the right n numbers. So this inequality um, propose an upper bound for the differences from our in-sample and out-of-sample prediction, right? And that was the that was the starting point of uh, a soft field in machine learning. They call it pack learning. So they call it pack because the statement mu equal to nu is probably approximately correct, right? And that's what's been referred to as pack learning. So probably because we have a probability, approximately because we are approximating within an epsilon value, and we are trying to understand how close that uh, those two values are actually, right? Is, that, is it clear? So later on, uh, we're going to start from this uh, it, has a, um, it has a sort of non-trivial um, proof, but it's not that hard. But we're going to start from this to come up with, uh, after several uh, derivations, we're going to uh, you know, arrive to a more generalized sort of approximation that is called VC dimension. Perhaps you've heard uh, about the buzzword. Uh, perhaps in two or three weeks, we're going we're gonna to talk about it. But for now, Hefting's inequality represents the an estimation between your in-sample and out-of-sample, right? The error between those. Question? OK. OK. So let's link that mu and nu to prediction problem, right? So now we have a b. We have some samples, right? So think about that being as the all the samples in the world, all the training set, right? It's a very big uh, number. You might not even be, you know, exhaustively searching that. If you can do that, it's even better, right? But your samples that you take from inside, so you have it. We call it E in. Those samples that were outside of your in sample is going to be E out, right? And in learning later on, we're going to talk about these two as so your mu, I'm sorry, your nu is going to be in sample, right? So E in of hypothesis, and your nu uh, and your mu is your out of sample, so E out of edge. So later on, we're going to refer to this as your training and test and, uh, you know, um, therefore you have training error and test error. Okay? So if we input these two to our Hefting's inequality, so this becomes the probability of in-sample error of edge, your hypothesis, minus your out-of-sample error of hypothesis is within epsilon and is smaller than or equal to that minus exponential, right? So another way not to, you know, mix these two is 
when you, when we call e in is those samples that you intake your these are your in sample that you have those that you don't have they are out of your sample right so e out question so really the hefting inequality to find how many like how big your sample needs to be and what is gonna be their precision. Yeah. That, that's that's uh, one of the major you know application of hefting inequality is to find an upper bound for that. Right. It is a very generalized uh, inequality. Later on you're gonna see that BC dimension that is deriving from here uh, this is gonna be more applicable to other you know sub problems. Um Yep. Questions? So we're trying to find what the, like what the data set is from the samples. The yeah, in, in, in hindsight, so how many samples you need to have in order to have certain error given an algorithm of machine learning, right? That's an upper bound. Uh, say somebody comes up with you with a data set and you know specifically uh, what hypothesis you're going to use. You're going to use, I don't know, neural network with back, back propagation, SVMs with quadratic programming, PLA or a perceptron. And then you're going to ask the guy, given the sample that you, you gave me, I don't think we're going to have a good prediction. Right? So that's one of the applications of that. There are a lot of factors involved, but this is, this, you know, forms an upper bound for that generalization. Okay? All right. So now, uh, now let's talk about the the representation of input, right? So as as a starting point, I brought up the MNIST data set which was a data set of handwritten digits from 0 to 9. It was um, it's a very well known data set as of 90s proposed by Jan LeCun, um, one of the, uh, you know, dominant figures in um, AI. He is now the, the head of AI at Facebook. And I was talking about the other day that he got the, with his two collaborators, he got the, the Turing Award a few months ago. Uh, okay, so that, that's a screenshot of the MS data set, right? So your training set includes these values. The values we have are handwritten digits, right? So how are we going to fit them into a machine learning? How are we going to include them, right? The other example would be the street houses, right? The number of, uh, every time I forget the, the we here. So a street uh, view, perhaps, yeah. Street view house numbers. So you have a data set of house numbers and I've left the link here. So this is another data set that you can, so if you want to train a model that takes as input these images, how are you going to do that, right? Let's see how we're going to represent such data. Okay, so say you want to input that digit one, right, and your input based on several other factors, accepts 25 pixel by 25 pixel, right? This is one way to represent your input. Say your, your input was one, so if you set a frame for yourself, 28 by 28, so those, uh, those smaller uh, sort of grid, that were the Uh, sort of superimpose, uh, superimposition of the one over those circles, uh, over those squares, are becoming one in the case of zero and one. In the case of having colors, you need to add more colors, so more, more, more features for that, like you can use one for red, one for green, one for uh, blue, or depending on the other color schemes that you want to have. But say they're only black and white, right? So we can represent our images in a 20 by 28 by 28 pixel, right? So, whichever the pixels were the, the, the handwritten digits was placed into, we're gonna, you know, uh, take into account that. And not only that, if we are taking into, uh, taking into account the degree of the black and whiteness, so we can assign a number 
from 0 to, I don't know, n, which is um, the greater, the, the darker the, the cell becomes, right? So this is another way to represent it. So our input are starting from x0, which was the, the, um, the artificial coordinate that we added as a threshold or the bias form. And then they're going to start from x1 up to 28 multiplied 28, right? So if you just vectorize that, it becomes up to 784. So our model would be a linear model with the same number of weights because we are trying to use a sine function uh, that they use a, uh, the, the perceptron over that, right? So we need to have a, a, a matching vector of weights, right? So the first issue comes at hand is now we have to deal with 784 just for, for one, you know, image. Are we going to actually need all of those, right? How hard would it, you know, uh, make the problem to train such model? And this is just a single, you know, handwritten digits. Suppose you want to uh, play around with uh, more sophisticated images, right? So one way to make this more, uh, or, or let's say one way to speed up the process of training is to find a way to downsize this large vector of inputs, right? So we can do it in many different ways. There are even machine learning models such as PCA and uh, auto encoders uh, doing that. But say for the for the purpose of being intuitive, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna define some features that only capture certain things out of that input digit. Say we are interested in the intensity of of the each of those pixels, right? Symmetry or uh, sharpness and so on and so forth. You can define many other things, right? So say we pick two of them only. So our linear model becomes much, much smaller, right? So we have now two features, one x0. So in, in this case, we're going to be downsizing our x0 to x784 to only x0, x1, and x2, right? So now that we can even, you know, uh, visualize it in, in two-dimensional way, right? One for the x1 and one axis for x2. Okay? So now let's see if we if we assign this way, what's gonna be our training data look like? So and say we are not interested in uh, you know classifying all those ten digits. We have made a classifier that only works on a binary case of either ones or fives, right? So blue refers to ones, and green dots refers to fives only, right? So we see that by our representation in two-dimensional way, using the the sharpness, and also the uh, I believe it was the symmetry. It was the symmetry. So we can. We can almost classify it in a nice way. There are some outliers here, here, that, that made the, the data not, not linear separable, right? But for instance, this one was actually pretty tough to even, you know, visualize and classify by human eye, right? That, that was supposed to be five. Um, but you see that in general, even with that two features, we are having a good good sort of you know classification. Now let's let's see how we're going to classify it, right? If we apply PLA here, and this is our training sample. So this is the training steps. We are going over several images and this is the the accuracy oh I'm sorry it's, uh, this is the yeah this is the error actually so we start with a high error and I mentioned before that this is the test out and in was the training error right so you see that because PLA only works with linearly separable data at some point, because we are not linearly separable, we come back 
and we go back up again. So we go back and forth and we sort of we can establish a trend in just going down something smooth like this, right? At some point it finds a misclassified point and then the, the accuracy drops or, or, or even increases at some point, right? It goes up and down all the time because the, 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 the data was not linear separable. So how are we going to alleviate this problem? First of all, let's see how many iterations we can expect a PLA to stop, assuming that this was a linear separable data, right? So PLA, which was proposed in 1957 by um, Rosenblatt, so it, it, it is well known uh, for his own theory. So we, we can define it as let W star be the output of PLA, so if assuming that our data was linear separable, the PLA terminates in almost T amount of iteration. So what's, my, uh, what's going to be the upper bound of that? So the R div uh, divided by P2R is the radius of the data set we have. So in vector space, when we use this norm, we can compute the distance between points, right? So say you have pluses, stars, and crosses, two classes, right? So the R would be actually the distance between this and this. And this actually presents the radius, radius of our data set, right? And P is the distance to our decision boundary. So whatever W we had, so at iteration one, iteration two, and you, you found a misclassified point, the distance between your misclassified point and your decision boundary represents your P, right? And you can define it by a margin. And margin was the W star on the, the last final step when it was converging. So you can easily compute the T as a, the, the upper bound of number of times PLA needs to be running in order to you know, find uh, a perfect solution for your linear separable data set. Right? So now, going back to the previous example, our data set was not linear separable. So how are we going to do that now? There is a very small extension to PLA, which is called pocket algorithm. And it's very intuitive as well. So it is very helpful when our data set is not linear separable. As, as uh, I mentioned, PLA, because it's not going to be guaranteed to terminate, right? It's going to go up and down. So you want to have a stable output. So pocket algorithm actually works as a pocket for your algorithm. So it keeps the best weight vector found up to iteration t and save it. And it only replaces it if a better vector, weight vector actually was found, right? It's so intuitive. So the steps would be you start from um, setting those vector of w, right, using each of your PLA iteration and for t from 0 up to t minus 1 you're going to run PLA and you're going to get one update out of PLA so you're going to update your line and evaluate your error your e in right and if the found e in was smaller than the previously best found e in you're going to update your w otherwise you don't do that right and then you're going to terminate at the end of your uh, for loop does that make sense Yeah, so so W0, W0 is the first element of vector W. Right? So you start so you start uh, iterating over all your training data. So each W that corresponds to one X, right? X0, X1, so W is W0, W1, and you go down the list all to you know towards all your training data. And then it's going to update only if it, if the error found was smaller than the previously found error, right? Yeah, um, my other question is uh, for the, the slide that we had, how to uh, get the, how to input the data? Right. Twenty eight by twenty eight grids. Right. Uh, the sharpness, intensity, and those kind of things are those the, like the new 
feature vector that we're going to have? Yeah. Or yeah. Is that the effect vector? Yeah. So we could have just have a 784 for all the pixels, features, right? Right. right. I, I mean, when you have an input, you have you have to have the same amount of features to match them, right? Because it's a first subtron. Okay. Because here, again, go back here. We make the perceptron. I'm gonna just show you. Yeah, here. At the end of the day, your hypothesis only calculates the sine function of the summation of w i x i's, right? And in vector space is just an inner pro inner product of w transpose and x. So these two should match. So, going back here, we could have. We could have done it for 784, but it was taking a much, much longer time, right? So we decided, why not we you know, devise a new features from sharpness, from intensity, from symmetry, from, I don't know, uh, diagonal symmetry, and are many you other things. These new, are, are, you, are you creating these new features, or are you just extracting those? Like, I mean, from x0 to x784, we already have intensity in it, symmetry in it, so we're just going to collect those, right? Is that what we do? Or we just come up with new features. Yeah, you, you come up with new features. Like that they are not in the 784. Yeah, but 784 is, is just the, the pixel-wise you know, image of your input image. For each pixel, if it was on and off, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or if you could have added like your, um, yeah, that was basically that. But in this case, just like the, the prediction for papayas, if it was tasty or not, if it came up, that was, that was the, the information we added as human to the problem. We thought, how are we going to classify tastiness of papayas, right? Might be the shape, might be the color, and also this. So you are interested in classifying vector uh, handwritten digits. So you think, OK, so there are 0 to 9. So how am I going to establish that between 1 and 5, right? So the 1 has sort of a symmetrical shape, perhaps 5, not to that same extent, right? So it's a good classifier, perhaps. Let me extract those okay, and then train my model based on that. Question like this: If it was like a colored digit, right? So we had another feature color. Yeah. Okay, can we go back? Yeah. So did we had like we, we would still use a twenty-eight pixel by twenty-eight pixel? No, twenty-eight by twenty-eight pixel is um, the classical Lacoon model for MNES data set. So that's why they call it Lenet one up to Lenet five. So the Lenet five was trained on this data set by Lacoon himself, and he was accepting 28 by 28 as input digits, right? So we are starting from, with that, but we are saying that are we going to able to classify them even with lower amount of output? Well, How so can we do not the picture of, it's not, it's not the vector of feature, it's the picture itself, it's the image. Yeah, yeah but, the image. but the vector of feature is coming from the input image as well. They should, should match them, right? right. Yeah. I mean, as as the task of you know somebody who works with machine learning, you just need to be able to add some information about how you're going to choose your vector of weights, right? But the learning itself will be done using an algorithm, right? But how you're going to choose that is going to change the output. I could have used any other different features, right? Nobody comes up to and tell me you need to use this for a specific algorithm. You can come up your your own. I mean, you need to come up, right? You should already know that x2 is responsible for the intensity. Right. right. And it's, it's just because we were interested in only classifying 1 and 5s, right? The actual shape of 1 and 5 could be classified because of the symmetry, because 1 could be symmetric, should be symmetric, right? Uh, what would be the size of uh, this x0, x1, x2? Uh, they are like vector, right? Yeah, each of them could be a vector, right? So what would be the size? Like, say, like, suppose we have uh, x2 is the intensity, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, is it going to be for every pixel? Or, like, how it could be? How we are going to decide that for one, x2 is the size? I mean, the, the easiest case would be you just have two numbers for that, mm -hmm. right? And that number could be either 0 and w zero or 1, or you can have a degree of sym symmetryness per se from 0 to 100, right? Just like the credit card approval, some of them were uh, continuous form, some of them were 0 and 1, right? Uh, here. So like this could be a, a binary thing or, or, or multi-class for gender, 
and an age could, should be an integer, and the rest, the salary and the debt could be, you know, a continuous form of from R, right? So you have different features. But the input was uh, 0 and 1, and that was defining the class, which was a linear bin uh, binary classification, right? But it's just like, it's just like saying for the accurate path, well, we use only the salary and income. Right, right, right. But how do you come up with the salary and that for a credit card approval because you think it makes sense because it's related, right? But when you train a model, you see the output, you see how related it was, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that clear? Okay. So, all right. So we talked about pocket algorithm, and then we said. The algorithm save, saves the best found until a better result reached, right? So in the case of PLA, we were going up and down with our training and test error. So that was our test and that was our training. But in PLA, the moment we found the best found so far, which was these two cases, and the rest of the training data weren't able to match a better, a lower, accurate, uh, a lower error rate for us. So we're going to keep them in the pocket up to the end. So at the end, we found these two as our uh, in-sample and out-of-sample error, right? So you see that pretty simple. We could have uh, avoided, you know, getting stuck into many different meaningless iterations, okay? And as the comparison at the end, so you're going to see that your PLA would stop somewhere here after those, a th those thousand iterations but your pocket algorithm could classify at this point. And you see there are only a few error left in a classification here. Right? Is it clear? Yep. So the PLA continued because of the number of training sets that you configured it with? Yeah. Okay. So say you had like 1,000 or 2,000 there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This one? Yeah, yeah. So like the gap, uh, we are checking the gap between the EOM and So like here, the EOM to use is like around 750 is smaller than the add zero as well. It's smaller than? So like we are taking in the pocket the zero as one gap, right? So. And, but the add 750 is smaller than. So here, for instance, we, we, we found a number, it was say 5%, right? Yeah. So, and we carried on carried on iterating over the, the rest of the training data, right? And on, on those examples, you see that it was the best found was here because there were no misclassification found up to this point. And perhaps here it, hit an, it found a new misclassified point. But in order to fix that, it ruined whatever it has achieved. So the accuracy error went up again. So in PLA, we would have gone up. But in, in Pocket, we just stayed there because these are far worse points. So we don't want to go there. That's why. OK. All right, so up until now, we were talking about a class of supervised learning that we are dealing with, an, with a discrete outcome, right? And it was called classification. So what if the outcome that we are interested in, in predicting is not, a, is, not, is not a discrete value, right? What if it's, it's a continuous value? And, that's, and that leads us to the major difference between classification and regression. Let's go back to the old problem of credit card approval. So in a classification case, you had your feature vector and your outcome, which was your label, as plus one or minus one, approve or reject, right? And that was your feature, based on the age, salary, etc. So, if we are interested in in finding not the not just the um, you know approval and disapproval, but the specific amount of credit that an applicant could be verified, that would change the the problem to a regression problem. So this would become. A value we call it perhaps dollar the number of the, the amount of dollar that an applicant could be approved with with that features right 
So we are, in this case, instead of approving or, or, or rejecting, we are predicting the credit line, the, the specific value in dollars for that. Right? So the output of our regression should find a way to output W transpose and X, and we are getting rid of the sign here, right? So there's no sign here to output plus and one. Okay. Yep. So then the difference here is that regression is quantifying what our label represents more than just. Yeah, regression. Yeah, so it's a classification deals with labels, discrete labels, either binary labels or like multi class labels, like digits or 0 to 10 or any number of classes, right? Um, but regression finds a specific real value, right, from, from the, the set of R values, right? So in this case, that, that value could be a credit line value. So like, I don't know, 2,500. Two okay. Okay, let's see another exam. So you have, you want to predict exam marks for the students, right? Say we want to find a way to mark the exam of the students. So we want to predict that we come up with some features. X1 as number of hours the, the students studied. X2 was the number of hours of sleep before the exam, age, height, and amount of alcohol consumed, right? So um, when, you, when you provide this model, you can assign your vector of W to that, right? You think that perhaps the more alcohol the student consumed, perhaps it's going to affect it in, in an adverse way in most of the students. Perhaps not. So in general, you might want to consider a minus W for that in, in your, in your you know, vector. Perhaps the more hours of sleep was helpful. So you, you, you thought that, OK, uh, W2 must be having a positive ratio, right? And, and, and you think it makes sense. And then your homegrown predictor would become something like your, your threshold, which, uh, that, that bias that we, we're going to get rid of as your x, x0 and w0. So you would you know, add that to your, these are the w numbers. So you would add that, like, this, is, this is very important. So the number of, sleep, the number of, number of hours they study should have a relationship, direct relationship with the, the x1. Number of sleep is important, but someone might get away with this. Uh, age doesn't matter in, in your in your own um, predictor. Height also doesn't matter, and then you assign a minus value for you know uh, the amount of alcohol consumed, right? So this is your own homegrown predictor. Now you can we use machine learning to learn these weights, right? That's the task for machine learning to learn the weights for us. Otherwise, we would have known the problem already. Zero for weight. Uh, is the machine have the chance gonna have the chance to increase that, or is it just out of equation? Yeah, it, it depends how you're gonna update that weight. And there are so many different algorithms. In, in PLA, there is one way to update. In, in neural network, you, you do back propagation to update. In SVMs, you do quadratic programming to update. So okay. each 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 uh, machine learn each hypothesis has a new learning algorithm. This, to me, this looks like the other thing that we're doing. It seems like we, we decrease the uh, features, so now we have less features. Right. We assign zero to some of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a very good point. So if if it turned out that after we found the predictor to predict for us, and we found that a feature was zero, in that case, that could potentially lead to a point that that was that was an unnecessary feature. We could have just get rid of that. It wasn't uh, biasing our you know um, prediction, right? There are so many different ways to, to understand your feature vector. Um, there are so many techniques, such as PCA factor analysis. Um, recently, we have autoencoders. You can even apply a simple <coughs> statistical test to, to find a correlation between your features and your data. And you can remove redundant features. You can downsample them. There are so many things we can do. Yeah. Questions? All right, so now that we came up with this homegrown predictor, are we, are we sure that this is going to work on unseen data? 
right? We just thought it's going to work. But without having a learner that gets trained on seeing many data points, we're not sure that this is going to work because you might just find somebody that doesn't sleep at all and then get he's, he's a number one student, right? Or the other extreme that uh, drinks alcohol a lot, but then he's a number one student. So there are always uh, ways that this can go wrong. All right. So let's see how we're going to formalize linear regression. So our training set, the big set of D, includes our points, right? X1 and Y1 as our label, right? So our Xs are from D dimensional space of R, and our Y, unlike the, the classification, we have also um, those labels from R as well. They're not discrete values. Right? And that's, the, that's the major difference between classification and regression. Okay, so we call our prediction function y hat. So y hat gets as input the x's, the vector of x coming from your training set. So each of these could be a vector. Coming back to your question, so each of these could be a vector, right? I could have just put bar here to show the vector. So this one tries to predict an unknown function of, because y was unknown. I'm sorry, f was unknown. We're trying to use hypothesis h to mimic our f, right? And the output of h is going to be y hat. And in order to evaluate our model, we're going to compare our y hat with the actual true y, which was the real label of those x's for training set. For an unseen data, you just apply the, the, the model and see the output and then find a way to evaluate it. OK, so our linear model goes like this. So your vector of x now defines that. This is extra. So w0, w1, x1 up to wd, xd, right? D dimensional space. Just like the previous case, we get rid of your x0 and w0. And now you have a summation of i from 0 up to d, wi, xi, right? And in vector space, so this is the vector. So you're going to have w transpose x. And these two match each other. Okay. Is it clear? All right. Now, let's see how we're going to calculate the error out of the prediction now. In linear regression, we normally use um, an average is square error, right? But let's see why we are using square error uh, with respect to the the absolute error, because this gives us a, um, a number, right? In, in in the case of credit card approval, a credit card line, so it's gonna give give us like I don't know, seventeen hundred, right? And the actual value looking at the the historical data was like seven hundred and fifty. Right? So we are 50 here off from the, the actual value. So how are we, how are we going to take into account that 50? Are we going to use the absolute value of that 50? Or are we going to use another method such as a square error to account for the, the differences between our actual and uh, the predicted value? So I brought up a, a recap slide here. For more information about the, the algebra, linear algebra, I mean, feel free to Google. I mean, this basically gives you any any answer. Also, I've up uploaded a, an ebook for uh, an introduction to linear algebra by Boyd, so a professor at Stanford, I believe. So, whenever you you needed some more reference to to refer to, if you found a buzzword you didn't know and you didn't want to uh, Google it, that that's a reliable source to to have a look at as, as a reference. So, as a recap. We are interested in using square error in general because of 
two different uh, distinct features. There are more properties in there, but we care mostly about these two. Say our x, our data, training data, is a random variable, right? So a random variable could be tossing a coin, could be picking a marble from that uh, bin of marble, or anything else. So either we are dealing with those kind of variables, or we are dealing with an independent variable. An independent variable could be age, time, or anything else. I mean, if you Google for these properties, there, there are tons of uh, statistical material uh, available. So let's talk about the first one for now. Say our x is a random variable, right? The estimator that minimizes the square error is mean, is mean of that plus a coin. However, if you use absolute error, the estimator that minimizes this, uh, that is going to become median for us. And when you go inside the world of random variable, if you have a mean and you have a mean of uh, a random variable, so you can actually disjoint them and then tie them individually. So E expected value x plus y could be or can be, and actually it is, e x plus e y, right? But if you use median as your estimator com comes from absolute error, you no longer have that property. So you're going to lose a nice property in many of the proofs that you want to have. So that's one of the advantages of having a square error as your estimator for the error. You all know what E stands for here, right? Expected value. If you don't know, you all know? Good? Okay. So in general, so for instance, if you toss a coin, the E of that could be, on average, almost half, right? Say a coin is, is coming like 0 and 1, right? Or if you have a... Um, um, if you toss... If you toss this game like from 0, 3, I don't know, 4, and then see, so you have, uh, if you have a toss like this from 1 up to 6, what's going to be the E of that? What is it? 1 over 6. 1 over 6? Yeah. No, e, e is the expected value. It's the average of your. So what's going to be that? 7.5. So, so you have 1, for, one to 6? 3.5. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be 3.5. Right? So that, that's the expected value. Um, anyhow. So if, e, if x is a random variable, so and if you use a square error, we have this nice property. So we can, have, we can define e of x plus y is equal to x plus ey. On the other side, if you are dealing with independent variables, such as time, age, so if you use a square error, again, we're going to be able to have this property of our variance, but if you use absolute error, this property won't hold again. I mean, if you wanted to see more um, properties about random variables and independent variables, th there's a link. You can have a look. I mean, there are tons of materials outside, and perhaps I'm not even, you know, I don't even know all of those properties because there are a lot of them. Depending on the application and depending on the domain, you might be interested in some of those. Uh, but make sure to, to have a look at those. Okay, so by now, we know that this is our formalization. We are interested in uh, finding a y from the R uh, set. And our predictor gives us a y hat. And we want to make sure how we're going to evaluate that, right? And we are using that for using a square error in order to compute that. And that leads us here to compute the average square error. So we call it capital E of M of your 
of our vector w. So for all of our vector w, we start computing one element, right? So the predictor, the, the prediction, and the actual value. We, we, uh, we normally call each of those individual elements a small ei, ei of w, which is a square error on i training example. So each of them gives you one e. So ed. And this is the 1 over n and the summation of that. So it's going to be taking into account all of those smaller e's. Right? Sometimes we call this a loss function in machine learning. This is the, the amount of uh, you know, error we had for individual training, right? Okay, I'm just going to stop here after this slide. Just wanted to show you an illustration of linear regression in two-dimensional way. So say you have an X and Y here. So this is your regression line. Because we have two features, you have a line here, right? So for each of your training points, you can compute your prediction, which is the blue line. It gives you the Y hat. And these are the actual points. So for each of them, you can compute E's, right? And the capital E would be the summation of all divided by N. So say you have another feature, and it, it, uh, become, it, it, it made your problem to, to a three-dimensional way. Now your estimator, your linear regression, is not a line, but a hyperplane, right? So it's a hyperplane of regression. So for each of those, we need to compute this, the distance between the points and the hyperplane. So, how are we going to minimize this? How are we going to learn how to, you know, um, update our hyperplane or how to update our linear regression? There are so many methods, and we're going to start talking about it in the next lecture. Okay, any questions? All right, so see you on uh, Wednesday. Okay. So even for the 2D dimension, we haven't talked about how we're going to